Ice Ice Birdie. Paul Childerly is after Capacali in frozen Lapland and David learns <laughs> to ski. Hello. Excuse me. <laughs> Row Bucks around the corner ahead of the Buck season opening in the UK on the 1st of April. Ollie Williams is out last season after Row and Red. The, the plan is to not be so shit at stalking and be more alert. And Parliament really doesn't like hunting trophies. An MP tells us how he tried to stop them banning trophy imports. What right do they have to impose restrictions that will damage our wildlife and people? We have a competition for you to win a place on the Aimpoint Pro Staff Programme. David brings you the news on the news stump and James Martington truffles out the best hunting and shooting videos in Hunting YouTube. Welcome to Field Sports Britain. more than the game and the hunting, it's almost religious. It's a winter wonderland at the top of the world and we are here to hunt it. We've returned to Swedish Lapland, well within the Arctic Circle, where the environment is going to test us and our kit. Paul has an opportunity to realise one of his bucket list hunts, winter, capercaillie and black grouse. We're told to prepare for sub-zero temperatures, but the mercury has dropped much further than expected. Minus 30 is what we'll be trying to cope with. Plus, the only way to hunt is on skis, something Paul has had little experience of and David has none. There's a lot to learn. There's a little bit about the conditions. Conditions are really good. Uh, it's clear. It's frosty. We got minus 27 degrees Celsius right now, so that's 50% more than in your freezer. Uh, so <laughs> it's going to be a bit frosty. You're going to see a lot of 11s in the first way, meaning that the, the snot will freeze oh. in the number of 11 on your upper lip. And you guys will get to train on your skiing skills. You finding any of this amusing? Yes, all of it. <laughs> <laughs> At the RV point we meet Robert, he's our guide for the next day and a half. He's also responsible for keeping us alive. How are you feeling, Chilberly? Quite simply cold. <laughs> <laughs> I've got everything on. This is going to be lifesaver, I think. But yeah, it is absolutely perishing. These boys are laughing at us. We're slightly out of our comfort zone, aren't we? Yeah, once again, we've, um, I think we've um, put it to the extreme, going from um, Mozambique with things trying to kill us to freezing cold and now we're at about frostbite, which actually is actually quite a worry, I think. So I think it was like minus 26, what was it, 26? Yeah. So far? Yeah. What's the score about frostbite then, Lars? Come on, come and tell us about frostbite. You mentioned it, I couldn't hear you very well in the car. Now, so if you start getting these white dots on your nose and face, yeah. so you guys need to look at each other, okay. just to check once in a while. So you don't want these white spots, because then you start losing the feeling, and then you get the frostbite. And you won't so, feel it, I mean, just literally? No, no, you won't feel it at all. So, uh, red nose good, red. white nose not black. so good. So Does that mean it's going to go black? Eventually. <laughs> you, you can get a little bit white nose and frostbite without you getting a black nose, but if you if you don't sort it out... Like this, yeah? Yeah. So you a, need to cover up. The new look. <laughs> Good plan. <laughs> <laughs> cabin is just what you'd hope for.
we're surrounded by snow and silence. The snow is about a metre deep, so the trick is to stay on the snowmobile tracks. Otherwise, you fall through it, which is why skis are essential to cross this terrain. What an extraordinary place. Yeah, unbelievable. Look at them trees. Look, look at it. Like, I actually really, really always wanted to do a hunt in the snow and live out in a cabin for a few days. And so for me, this is like another one of the major tick in the boxes. It's like minus 27, 28. On the back of the skidoo, my God. Within like 30 seconds, your fingers are gone, your toes are gone, you've got your normal walking boots on, your feet, my bottoms of my feet were just frozen. And where there's a gap in there, in the um, goggles there, oh, it was like someone was like poking a stick in my face. But you know. <laughs> I tell you, it doesn't take long. It takes only five minutes in that cabin and suddenly you feel human again. Yeah, yeah a bit of food, a bit of water. We're ready to go without zero of the rifle now. So we've got 100 meter, we're gonna put, we're gonna put a box out and um, make sure she's uh, still zeroed in from the traveling. Three flights we had. This is the ammo, TRG Precision. And this is also gonna be the target. I'll be back. Way up. Way up. <laughs> Zeroed it with a cold barrel at home because we're going to cold conditions. I thought that was quite clever of me. A bit time consuming. You know, last, last part of the season was very busy, so it's literally nip off, have two shots, um, change it, and then come back to it again another day. So, yeah. I'm, I'm pretty confident she's going to be singing. With the Sacco S20 on the song, it's the moment of truth. So many questions. Are they wearing too few or too many layers? Oh, yes. How far will the shot be? Okay. How does a rescue chopper land on snow? Has David considered how he's going to ski and film? <laughs> um, I'm a snowboarder, not a skier. Well, this is a virginity. Yeah, 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 yeah. I had some when I was, uh, we found some when I was about 12 in a tip. And I had a little go back in Gloucestershire down some of the banks with some old clip-on ones. I had my welly, welly boots on and um, some clip-on skis and went off, off some Gloucestershire banks. That was uh, interesting. Right up. Okay. Oh, outwards. Okay. 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 Just getting used to this job. Okay. Interesting. After five minutes of pre-flight checks, most of the self-doubt is gone. I'm good. Because we are in one of the most beautiful landscapes in the world. <laughs> Help. <laughs> Hello. Excuse me. Once in the groove, we cover plenty of ground. Most of the hunting is done over these vast wetlands, which we would have been crossing in the summer, chasing moose. Time for some fuel, or not. So you were feeling pretty punchy yesterday. Yeah, I had a bright idea of taking a camel pack. It's frozen solid. <laughs> oh There's a few things that uh, don't try, don't quite work out in these temperatures, does it? No, no. Literally, out of zero, my my scope had frozen up. The scope cap. <laughs> this is not the UK. Lapland requires specialist kit and survival skills. You can tell that Robert is at one with this environment. It's his happy place, and as the sun moves across the sky, the whole landscape changes. 
he tells us this is the blue hour. How, many, how far do you reckon we've gone today? Probably around eight. Hey! <laughs> 100 metres. <laughs> the silence. The sun. Ah, I just love it. It's fantastic. Unfortunately, we haven't seen birds sitting in the treetops today, but it's a blessing. We know now what is expected of us, and so far, there are no busted knees or frostbitten noses. How's that for a first, first afternoon, Mr. Chaudley? That was great exercise. <laughs> hey, wonderful. It was, uh, I wouldn't say it was relaxing, it was good fitness, and uh, beautiful to be out, and so, so, so quiet. And um, <laughs> as we get the snowmobile coming past us, uh, yeah, yeah, apart from our ride, and uh, no, much of a sauna. We were a sauna, we didn't see a cup of Kelly, but it was good, it was good training exercise, I think, for both of us, yeah, yeah. And um, luckily, I didn't fall over, but somebody fell over a couple oh. of times. Oh, there he is, he fell over again. <laughs> <laughs> So what's the plan today then, Robert? The plan today is to, get to go to another location. We had quite a poor bird watching, or we didn't see that many birds. Y yeah, yeah. Actually, we saw none. Yeah. So we're going to a really, really big marsh today, and hopefully we can find some birds. Yeah. Yeah, we're going to go lots of, lots of distance to make sure David yeah. puts in the miles. Because yeah. he said, <laughs> yeah. what did he keep saying yesterday? Have we done eight, eight miles yet? Have we done 8K, was it? Or eight miles? 8K. Yeah. yeah. I think we'll beat the 8K. Yesterday, okay. but uh, I think we'll double it. Double it. Yeah. Shall we? Ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Are you? Born ready. David. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> While Robert attends to David, who needs to stop lying down on the job, Paul is sent on ahead, and as luck would have it, spots our first capercaillie of the trip. Robert mounds up the snow to make a rock-solid shooting position and covers it with a white sheet. Yes. Yes, time. Well done. Hey, 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 hey. <laughs> <sighs> Thank you very much. Hey, um. Yeah, nothing to do. You, you spotted it yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so Can I just say, right? You said there were two, right? Oh, so I go. saw two in the frame, and then then you shot a third. <laughs> did, you see, did you see the third? When I saw it fall out, I shot just like I did with Roundtree in the in yes. last year. So it's like, come on, boys, yes, give me a break. Thank you, Robert. Good stuff, mate. Thank you. We got one. We got one. I don't want to damage him. Wow, we. My first ever 
Capricoli. Look at that. <laughs> fantastic. Thanks, Robert. Much appreciated. It's absolutely fantastic. We definitely work for it. So that's the white spot, that. 240 meters or 270 yards, maybe. Yeah. yeah. Straight through there, and that's the white spot on that side. I'm very happy. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Yep. Fantastic. As this GoPro footage shows, sometimes the cappers flush from under the snow when the skis get too close for comfort. Frederick filmed it, and he will be guiding us next. So, is this one of the, the, roost, the roosting holes, is it? Yeah. yeah. And they literally just, they just drop down through the snow. Yeah. Huh. You said they don't always pop out in the same place. No, they can't. They can't make it. They can, it's a small wooden thing. Like aisle or something. Like tunnel. 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 Yeah. Tunnel, yeah. 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 And then so be, sometimes you can see the hole, and the bird can pop up. Pop up. Yeah. Yeah. There's a droppings in there. Look, David. Yeah. I can't move. <laughs> <laughs> I'll fish a couple out for you. Oh, thanks. You're going <laughs> to flick them to me, are you? There you go, look. Where? Hey! <laughs> we have clearly hit the right spot, as there are more birds in the trees ahead of us. Robert says it's OK to take another. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Robert. <gasps> Brilliant. You take that glove off, you've got the under glove, you can't shoot with an under glove, you've got to take it with, yeah. with the skin. Yeah. And then, of course, start to freeze. Yeah, as soon as you touch anything metal, yeah. bang, it's like yeah. pain. Yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> Great stuff. Two birds. Two birds, eh? It's definitely up there with one of the best hunting experiences we've ever had and it's strange to discover that this style of hunting is not popular here. Moose hunters don't turn into bird hunters in the winter. Ah. Ah. Thanks, <laughs> Thanks for looking after us. Yeah, no I've had such a great time. No, so, so, so much fun. Amazing experience. Success and many different uh, experiences. Yes, I got my first. Yeah. Cafe Curly's, thank you very much. Well. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, and uh, also you learned a few tricks with the old sauna. So we we reignited your interest in. Yeah, yeah. Paul me, Paul taught me a, a few thank tricks. You. Yeah, he's yeah. a Mr. Sauna now. We <laughs> held a chicane behind the camera. So, <laughs> yeah. Thanks, David. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. Lars drives us an hour to see yeah, our new host, like Frederick Lindvall, and our new cabin. This one is on the edge of one of the mighty Lapland rivers. The weather has changed again. It's warmer, but wetter. Paul wants to check zero again, as he wasn't as happy with his second shot as he was with the first. Different area. I think it's actually a, an island between two rivers. So different guides, so it'll be a different style of hunting, no doubt. So yeah, I think we've got a chance of some black grouse as well, so that'd be quite interesting. Okay. Yeah. But you're just um, going to check the rifle because... Uh... Yeah, just yesterday we shot and there was a bit of a crosswind. It just, it just was nowhere near, there's no reference. We got into um, about 160 and we shot it, but it was still not quite... There's so many different variables, that's the problem, oh, isn't it's, there? It's amazing because, like, you know, we're speaking to different people that have been out over the last few days with this cold weather and a couple of other rifles weren't actually even working. That physically, the, the the firing pin wasn't striking the bullet, so you know we had no problem with that. The rifle was totally working, everything else. I was just a hey, long distance. There was a crosswind. It might have been just pushing pushing to the uh, right a little bit. So, but uh, yeah. better safe than sorry. Yeah. The snow's different, isn't it, underfoot as well? Yeah, it's different. It's, um, and there's a lot more sign of other animals as well. So it's like reindeer sign, fox sign, um, 
and we're straight into birds straight away. So you've probably been roosting and been feeding. So yeah, totally different hunt. It's much harder going than before. Even Childerly takes a tumble. The biggest problem when you do go over is there is no ground to push against. The snow is deeper than the length of your arm. I'm glad you just you had one to know what it feels like. <laughs> Don't worry, I won't tell anybody about this. You've got a reputation to maintain. <laughs> the birds are not playing today. We have some welcome chocolate nibbles and some blueberry soup. Can't beat a few calories to lift the mood. So we have to start up here. Yeah. So I hope you find some bird in here. Yeah. Do you find the birds stay in certain areas or do they, they move to the food? Yeah, I hope they go up in the trees to food to and food. don't go on the ground. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If we have lucky, they sit now and eating. Yeah. yeah. Fingers crossed. Yes. And we must have travelled at least 15 miles, I would have thought, so <laughs> far. Yeah, at least. <laughs> Frederick, come on. <laughs> oh, we have. Six kilometers, maybe. You're joking. Six. No yeah. way. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's changes. probably. I feel like about two. Obviously, David more like fifteen. <laughs> Honestly, I do feel like. Because you see the distance between one set of trees to the other, and that's a kilometer. No, it's not. It is. No, it's not. No, it it's, oh, it's your eyes. It, 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 glass has steamed up. This is now our third straight day of hunting with plenty of kilometres under our belts, or skis, and it's taking its toll. Quite a day. Quite a day, indeed. We've, uh, it's a little bit warmer today, it's one good thing, but we've walked some, well, we've skied some serious uh, kilometres. Hard going, seriously hard going. This wife was actually frozen, totally frozen. That fingers are sticking to, to the barrel. Um, yeah. yeah, so, uh, yeah, what a day. Didn't, uh, we see one fly at the end in the blue hour, they call it. Um, so, yeah, I took a tumble today. Uh, exhausted. I need a beer and chill out. Yeah, it was um, out of the, this is the third day. Yeah. But really, I found this one the hardest. Yeah, the snow was deeper. Um, a lot of obstacles were going through, a lot of woodland. Um, and also the visibility, you're not seeing quite so far, so you're not, there's nothing driving on, driving you on mentally. Um, you're sort of like just looking at the site, you know, 150 yards of trees and you're going really close trees all around you. So, uh, yeah, so it's quite different, a lot different than the last two days. <laughs> yeah. I'm in a, in a steam room. Yeah, I know. I'm going to cheer again. We're not even in the sauna yet. <laughs> there we go. That's a little so bit. I can see you. <laughs> That evening, Frederick cooks up a feast on the fire in the sub-zero temperatures. The following morning, before we get kitted up, we head to the river to see the ice hole where Frederick has been collecting water. It is weird hearing the flowing Frozen water beneath up. us. A little bit eerie. This is our um, borehole for the water for the cabin. So, Wow, so last day. It's been quite a trip, hasn't it? Yeah, day four. Um, today the weather looks actually a little bit nice, actually. So, got, I think I've got the right amount of layers on. A little bit tired this morning, but uh, ready for action. To keep David on his toes and his skis, we need to cross a road, then cross the frozen river to the hunting ground. Probably sensible that this isn't his first introduction to the skis. Once across, we're soon in contact with birds. Paul discards the skis and gets set. Happy Frederick. Yeah, I'm really happy. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a Swedish Lapland happy? Yes. That's you absolutely over the moon. <laughs> hey! <laughs> oh, brilliant, fantastic. It's another great shot, and Frederick is over the moon, Swedish style. It is an older bird. 
Yeah, big, big old male. Bit of colours in it. We've done what we came for and did it with style. Not much grace, but definitely style. And what an epic trip that has it all. Anyone that wants to push yourself rifle shooting, this is the place to be, you know. You know, a lot of effort to get out to where you need to get to in severe weather, but also the, the equipment as well. So yeah, anyone that's doing uh, into rifle shooting and into like uh, pushing yourself to the limit, then this is, this is the place for you. Oh yeah. And as we've Got shown, this. the inability to ski is not a barrier to success. To book a capercaillie and black grouse hunt with either Robert or Frederick will cost about 3,000-ish pounds for one person and around 4,000-ish pounds for two. That buys a four-night, three-day hunt with transfers, food, accommodation and with rifle and ski loan included. Contact details below. For more about the Sacco S20 and its hunter stock in Roughneck Green, which, if it can perform here, can perform anywhere, go to sacco.fi. And if you want to visit Swedish Lapland, check out heartoflapland.com. Thank you, Paul. Please let us know in the comments below if you have ever tried skiing with firearms. Now, this week's prize is a peg at Guseni Sporting. £1,100 normally buys you a day shooting high Welsh pheasants and partridges next season. One lucky winner is going to get it for free on the 3rd of November 2023. Plus, we will be there to film the day. Find out how to win it on Field Sports Extra and watch Field Sports Extra by joining the Field Sports Nation. £5 a month, link below, and support our work. If you want to book shooting with Grisani Sporting, it really is an exceptional shoot and a lot cheaper than going to Lapland. There is a link below. They have availability in September and October for partridge and pheasant shooting, including back-to-back -back days if required. Next, Aimpoint has a competition for you. If you would like to take part in Aimpoint's talent search, there is a link below. Go to the website, scroll down, and click on the Field Sports Channel link. It's one of our lucky viewers who will be selected. Now, a word from Maven. We are Maven. We focus on the fundamentals. Clean, simple designs with the very best modern materials and technologies. We refuse to compromise our mountain town roots to follow the well-worn path to a dollar. We choose instead to make game-changing gear and use it in the places and pursuits that inspire us every day. We are Maven, a company focused on the design and creation of innovative products for and by the modern outdoorsman. We have a lot of kit in this week's show and you can see plenty of it at the Northern Shooting Show from the 6th to the 7th of May 2023 in Harrogate. Tickets are free for children aged 15 and under and £20 for adults, a £5 discount on the gate price if you book online. Parking is free and there's a link in the description below. Next, fully recovered from frostbite, it is David on the Field Sports Channel News Stump. This is Field Sports Channel News. The Countryside Alliance has made an official complaint to the BBC over its report that the decline in the UK adder population is because of pheasants. The BBC ran reports on two separate radio programmes and the Alliance has filed two complaints relating to issues of bias on BBC Radio 4's flagship news and current affairs programme today and a segment on BBC Radio 2's Jeremy Vine show. Both shows featured a discussion between BBC presenter and author Nicholas Milton, who is promoting his new book, which predicts adders will be extinct across most of Britain in the next 15 to 20 years, and that the reasons for this include the release of 60 million pheasants that kill adders. He also claims pheasants peck out the snake's eyes. The Alliance says there's no scientific research or evidence to support the claim. Mr Milton went completely unchallenged, um, you know, citing uh, a, a research study uh, from a citizen science survey from 2019. Uh, you know, reading that 
Uh, it doesn't have any which actually mentions that as once. Uh, you know, it identifies three key reasons why uh, adders uh, are in decline in the UK. Um, none of those include pheasants. Basque is warning of disastrous consequences for moorland unless the RSPB rethinks its position. In an open letter to the charity's chairman, Kevin Cox, Basque calls out the RSPB's increasingly negative public attitude towards game shooting. The letter says that this is entrenching positions and creating barriers between groups and organisations which should be working together more than ever to tackle our climate and nature emergencies. Basque claims an example of a divisive approach is the RSPB's campaign for members of the public to report moorland fires. It says that the high-profile campaign is misleading, extreme and leads to police needlessly confronting gamekeepers. It's a waste of uh, taxpayers' money. Uh, it takes up valuable time of DEFRA and Natural England and we know that the people on the ground are absolutely complying with the new burning regulations. So it's, it's creating a false narrative which suits the RSPB's agenda. Um, we tried to talk to them internally about it and not really got anywhere, so we thought it was time to basically produce an open letter with our concerns, with a number of recommendations as to how we think they can improve the situation. Residents of an island in the Outer Hebrides have rejected a plan to cull all its deer. By a majority of three to one, the 379 residents who live on the 93,000 acre South Uist estate voted down the culling of around 1,200 deer. A survey last autumn found that some islanders had concerns about deer management. These included damage to gardens, crops, crofts and incidents involving vehicles. Islanders are also fearful of a link to deer and Lyme disease. The Scottish Gamekeepers Association warned that the cull would have put local jobs at risk. Island communities and the Highland communities in Scotland have had a long, long history of trying to ensure that young people are not constantly moving out of their area and that the, the opportunities exist in these communities. It's been a, a perennial problem for, for governments for a long time and the fact is that there are jobs here, there are opportunities. Field sports groups are working together to increase the amount of venison they feed to the homeless. The pilot scheme by the Country Food Trust, Forestry England and Farm Wilder have come together to deliver protein-rich, low-fat, low-cholesterol venison meals to food banks, schools, hospitals, the armed forces and prisons across the country. The pilot is starting with food banks. Forestry England will supply five tonnes of wild venison from forests in Devon and Cornwall to Farm Wilder this year. By the end of the year, the Trust hopes to feed a million visitors to food banks on wild venison ragu and is hoping to meet with DEFRA to explore scaling up the project so it can address food poverty across the country. A former DEFRA advisor has sparked anger on Twitter by saying that sheep have got to go from UK hillsides. Ben Goldsmith, brother of ex-Tory MP Zach Goldsmith, claims the animals are the principal obstacle to nature recovery in Britain's national parks. He says sheep should not be subsidised and claims the UK is impoverished of wildflowers, birdsong and wildlife due to the forensic grazing by tens of millions of sheep. In the backlash on Twitter, one user describes his words as a load of nonsense. Another says he's out of touch. Farmer Gareth Wynne-Jones says sheep are a valuable part of the conservation equation. These are an intricate part of our biodiversity. They're an intricate part of what we do on the uplands. And if people don't understand that, they're in the wrong job. There's thousands of families, family farms, that depend on these animals. So please, get behind British agriculture and make sure that you understand what you're talking about. A wildlife charity is calling for a cull of grey squirrels. Following the success of projects run by air gunners in Cumbria, Anglesey and the Isle of Wight, the Exmoor Squirrel Project is trying to own the idea and says it could be the answer to reintroducing the native red species in Devon. Red squirrels can't live alongside grey squirrels, which carry a parapox virus that the American imports are immune to, but is deadly to British reds. Ignoring at least two large-scale red squirrel projects in Cornwall, the charity claims the South West hasn't seen a red squirrel in the wild for up to 70 years. Horse riders are hoping for a review of paid for permits by Forestry England will see them scrapped. Forestry England, which oversees the system, maintains that paid for permits are important to avoid clashes between horse riders and ramblers or bike riders. 
Mark Weston, director for Access at British Horse Society, which represents three million riders, says it's discrimination as horse riders should have free access as walkers and cyclists both have free access. A consultation on the issue is open until the 9th of April 2023. Link below. Thanks to Richard Walton for the story. In the Netherlands, a new party has become a big winner in the Dutch provincial elections. The success of the farmers' citizen movement, known as BBB, follows a wave of rural anger at government environmental policies. It will determine the makeup of the Senate and cast doubt on the government's ability to pass key legislation, including its plans to shut down Dutch farming in order, it claims, to slash nitrogen emissions. Thanks to Eric van der Horst for the story. Staying with the Netherlands and a Dutch technology company says it's got the AI to stop poachers. Hack the Planet says its artificial intelligence powered system can help detect both poachers and animals in real time. The system includes a camera trap that's been modified so that it can wirelessly download images to a computer. Artificial intelligence automatically classifies whether it's animal or human in the photo. A satellite modem sends the information directly to the phones of rangers. The tech startup is testing the boxes in the Netherlands, Gabon and Slovenia. And finally, in Norfolk, drivers were shocked to see a herd of deer galloping across a road. Cars were stopped as hundreds of animals dashed across the road. Members of the Bacton Coast Guard captured the site and posted the video on Facebook, where it attracted hundreds of thousands of views, more than 8,000 likes and more than 900 comments. You are now to date with Field Sports Channel News. Stalking the stories, fishing for facts. Buying shooting kits? Then head to Kit Finder, and our team will help you find the right product at a fair price from dealers all over the UK. Kit Finder, the shooting kit comparison website. Thank you, David. And an extra item. We are sorry to hear of the passing of Kenny Wright at the age of 57, a good friend to many stalkers and countryside people in the southwest of Scotland and elsewhere. A senior wildlife manager at Till Hill, he was a much-loved shoot captain and countryman. He leaves a wife, Donna, three daughters and a granddaughter. Thanks to Robert Hughes for letting us know. Later in the show, we find out how our elected representatives have been wasting our votes. Now, a word from Pulsar. Next up, Ollie Williams goes on a red deer ramble across Cornwall where he scares more animals than he shoots. There are a lot of deer to shoot here in Cornwall. So many, Ollie Williams reckons, that the only way to get close to the big red stag he wants is an ambush. The wind's a bit annoyingly difficult today, so not your standard. Southwesterly, so we are going to um, stalk down, basically stop, and then just wait, and then in this spot where you can look over this entire um, heather bank, uh, and the sun shines lovely, lovely and bright into it this time of day. So the I imagine the hinds and it will be laying up with their stags. Fingers crossed, we can uh, find a couple. The vast majority for us is crop damage, um, whether it be you know our arable tenants. I've actually seen reds digging digging potatoes out of the ground. Um, we have a, one of our main tenants is a big potato farmer, so not, and obviously potatoes are very expensive. Again, maize they hammer maize and maize is a thousand pounds an acre these days. Yeah, it's it's mostly crop damage, but also you know um, if you get them in two bigger numbers, they will browse in inverted commas um, and go down through. New, uh, new plantations and hammer them as well. So, yeah, I mean, I love to have the like, reds around personally. Um, I love to see the big stags around, um, but you've got to keep on top of them. And I've seen, I mean, I've seen this stag in particular for four or five years now, and he seems to get better and better. I figured, uh, you know, I'll take him if we can see him, but you know, I'll never see him again. Now, now I've confessed to it. Red deer are not the only wildlife lurking in these woods. We're stalking through one of the main drives at the shoot. At this time of year, there are pheasants ringing out our presence from all sides. 
This time of year, deer, in theory, if they're living around here, they've got, they're so used to pheasants going bonkers for no reason, because they do. I'm never sure if it's a good thing or a bad thing. I'm pretty, it can't be good, really, because it. Oh, so, well, there we are, look, that's what they should be doing. Oh, well. Um, Planning your next shoot day. Yeah, exactly. The sun is starting to dip and the shadows are lengthening. Ollie has a new pair of binos to try, the Steiner Ranger LRF in 10x42. They are range-finding binos and, crucially in this light, they have guards to block out sunlight from the eyepiece or ocular. When you have the sun right on your face, there's a minor tree here, but just having those, having those eyebrow guides, guards, or the eye guards, and at this point I'm actually looking right into the sun almost and they're, they're still performing pretty well. I'm pretty impressed with these, I must admit, so far. We reach the bank and sit and wait, which gives the birds time to settle down and the deer to come out. Well, we could go in looking for them, but we'll more than likely just because it's so thick in here. We'll just bump, we'll just bump them and we'll, 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 we'll be like, they'll be gone. Whereas with the amount of birds around as well, that's better just to stay put and the sun will just set on this bank. Um, so if you're a deer, you want to get an early feed or have some last minute rays. I've, just, I've seen them just lying in this heather. We give it half an hour. During that time, Ollie is able to range finds to the bank and see how shootable it is from our position. So novelty is the Africa. I have a range finder in these now. I'm the first ever range finder. Right, so turn them on. And then you press. There we are. There. Also, they have a golf mode as well. Golf mode. Yeah, which is very important for myself. See how far how far I can top the ball. No, right. So yeah, so it's 250 to the middle of that bank. Pretty much. 256. Half an hour passes and no deer appear. Ollie decides to walk on up the valley. He's convinced a red stag is there. And he's right, it runs out of the woods and up the field away from us. Ah! Joking. <sighs> Bugger. That was a good stag as well. Bam. Um, the, the plan is to not be so shit at stalking and be more alert. We decide to call it and go off and look for a roebuck on another part of the ground. Our red deer adventures are not over. First of all, there's a stag trapped in the pheasant pen deep in cover. A roebuck patrolling the fence line spots us and spooks the stag. Deer trapped in pheasant pens can cause damage, but with both of them aware of us now, they are tomorrow's problem. Next, we stop on a stream in a wood and spot two hinds in the fields beyond. They might not be alone, then. I wouldn't be surprised if they're alone this time of year. We creep closer to see if there is a stag with them. It's very interesting to see how they react to the pheasants. The pheasants have all seen us, but they're not, they don't seem to be too bothered. The answer to the question, do deer pay attention to pheasants flushing? The answer appears to be no, because like I said, the pheasants have all seen us. These beasts are convinced of their own invincibility. You're supposed to be keen in the eye, you silly animals. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> ah! Right, well, let's carry on. Last stop of the evening is a field where Ollie has seen Roebuck. With the light going, this is going to be a test for the Steiner optics. Ollie's rifle scope is a new Steiner Ranger 8. His rifle is a Benelli Lupo in 6.5 Creedmoor. Yes, he has gone for the calibre equivalent of soft leather underpants. It is unmoderated and he would like to shoot both animals, right and left. One down, just 15 feet away, the other buck is unperturbed. It continues munching on Ollie's pasture. So um, after being a, a jovial uh, abuser of the 6.5 Creedmoor gang, I firmly joined it and I can see why. Because the first two shots on, on game with the, with, with the rifle, uh, the Benelli Lupo, which is a gorgeous bit of kit, um, Drop them like a stone, so cannot 
well, I cannot praise the, praise the rifle high enough and obviously the scope as well. I mean, we're last light now. Um, and that has just brought in so much more than I could see. Pretty standard around here. They're not, nothing's new. One thing we don't get around here is special bucks, which is a shame, but I don't shoot them for heads, I shoot them eating. So they will eat very well. It's been a wonderful English lowland stalk with the highs of challenges overcome and a few lows too, and crucially, two carcasses in the larder. For more about Steiner's range of binoculars and rifle scopes in the UK, go to distributorgmk.co.uk or search for them on Kidfinder. Thanks, Ollie. Now, one of my favourite stories in the last week is the shark that washed up on the beach in the south of England and someone cut its head off. Unlikely to cook it, more likely to boil it out and mount it on a wall. Anyway, according to the MPs who bothered to turn up for the debate last Friday, everyone hates trophies and nobody in modern Britain would want to do such a thing. I am very, very sensitive about racism and I spoke out against this bill because I fundamentally believed that it was a neo-colonial attempt to control conservation management programmes of African democratic countries. Representatives from Angola, Botswana, Namibia and Zambia who are involved with the conservation activities in what's called CASA, the Kavango Zambezi Transfrontier Conservation Africa, commented, what right do they have to impose restrictions that will damage our wildlife and people? It's not just conservation madness in the name of animal rights. It's racist too. In Westminster, Sir Bill Wiggin is leading the opposition to a private member's bill by MP Henry Smith to ban the import of hunting trophies. He is one of a few voices of dissent as MPs ignore pleas from scientists and pleas from African nations. The current system is that the, the squeaky hinge gets the oil. The, the people who shout the loudest, the antis, are being listened to and that strikes me as a particularly bad way of, uh, of legislating. MPs from across the political divide spoke in favour of the bill, including the former Labour leader, Jeremy Corbyn. Perhaps he could join the rest of us in congratulating all those many campaigners all around the country that have worked so hard to draw attention to the issue of trophy hunting and ensured that we've got such a good attendance here today. And that in itself becomes an education to people to understand that we can play our part in conservation of beautiful and endangered species by passing this bill today. And we are sending a very strong message to the rest of the world that in this country, where we can, we are demonstrating our support for endangered species as set out by CITES. These wonderful, magnificent animals, which some of which are on the brink of extinction, are worth so much more than a mere trophy on the mantelpiece. Trophy hunting is a relic of the past. It has no place in modern Britain. In second reading, I, I argued that trophy hunting is an ugly relic of the colonial era. What I would add to that today is that is trophy hunting and poaching is in fact illegal for locals. For the record, locals going hunting is not illegal in African countries that rely on hunting to pay for conservation. To their credit, and following Field Sports News campaign, pointing out the lies they told about wildlife during the second reading of the bill, MPs told far fewer lies at the third reading. Sir Christopher Chope and Sir Bill Wiggin tabled 30 amendments to the bill. The government accepted two of them. An advisory board on hunting trophies will be established. The Secretary of State will not be able to add new species to the ban list and the law will be reviewed after five years and, if found wanting, scrapped. Uh, Sir Christopher Chope. Ma Madam Deputy Speaker, I'm, I'm very grateful to my honourable friend for saying that he supports a new clause uh, for the, the background uh, to this has been explained that there are diametrically opposed expert opinions on what would be a good hunting ban of trophies and what would not be. And I think it's important that this debate should be informed by the facts and the science. I have been concerned throughout the progress of this bill, however, that it is not motivated by a desire to see African wildlife flourish and prosper. If it were, then it would have paid heed to the scientific evidence provided by experts in conservation. British conservationist Professor Amy Dickman and Adam Hart have argued that 90% 
of protected areas with lions are severely underfunded. Removing trophy hunting without providing a suitable alternative of revenue <coughs> will expose those underfunded protected areas to further risks such as poaching. According to the IUCN Red List, trophy hunting is not considered to be a threat driving any species to extinction. Instead, trophy hunting generates revenue for anti-poaching and habitat conservation. Environmentalists, community leaders and ordinary Africans agree the new law could be a disaster for conservation because landowners will replace wildlife with cattle. Trophy in imports shouldn't be banned because if you're banning trophy hunting, it's like you're cutting off the chain of the money that is generated from trophy hunting that goes into local conservation efforts and local communities. And that would be putting a dent on a lifetime of efforts of people who have tried who, to save endangered species through the funds generated from the conservation and trophy hunting. The government wanted to set an example, and I think there's a real danger that the example it will set is that white British people know better about conservation than African governments, democratically elected, who, to be fair, are doing a better job than British people did when they were in the colonial age running those countries. So Africans are doing a brilliant job on conservation. I don't think it should be for us to tell them how they should do it. The bill covers nearly 6,000 species, including scimitar oryx and montibok, which only exists thanks to hunting. It will now face further scrutiny in the House of Lords before it can become law. I think in the House of Lords there are more uh, peers who are likely to speak out. I was very sad that in the House of Commons there was very little uh, resistance to this bill. I was the only person who spoke out against it at second reading um, and uh, I was very pleased to be joined by one or two colleagues later on and we were able to get amendments to the bill because there is some sympathy in government for the conservation efforts that the UK is making. But one of the arguments we have is that African countries want to be able to use trophy hunting to increase the incomes of villages and people committed to living with large and dangerous animals. And I don't think that's something that the British people understand because, of course, we don't have lions wandering around near schools. Uh, and if we did, I think we'd feel very differently about it. As many as are of that opinion say aye. aye. Of the contrary, no. I think the eyes have it. That was the third reading. The bill now goes to the House of Lords. Thanks all who took part in that. A waste of Parliament's time and the last in the series of three pointless livestock and wildlife crime laws brought in by Boris and Carrie Johnson, which we're discussing over on Field Sports Extra. Thanks to the Field Sports Nation, we are bringing a series of court actions against newspapers and anti-hunting MPs for busting copyright. Uh, and printing pictures of people with the animals they've shot. And there's a link below if you'd like to know more about that. We can't get them on hate speech, so it's a bit like getting Al Capone on tax evasion, but it may have an effect. We're already doing all we can on the benefits of hunting tourism. Please give us at least a thumbs up on this video for that. Now from politics to the wider world of hunting and shooting films on YouTube, brought to you by James Marchington, it is Hunting YouTube. This is Hunting YouTube, a James to show the best hunting and shooting videos that YouTube has to offer. My favourite this week is eight-year-old Finn Buckley, who's mad keen on field sports and has his own YouTube channel. In this one, he's going through the woods hunting rabbits and squirrels with a Harris hawk, thanks to his dad, Sam, for sending that one in. After travelling around the UK, Dave Carey is back on his home turf, enjoying a lovely day on driven pheasants at an estate near Ripon in Yorkshire. Here's another wonderful driven day, this one with JP, the seated gun. We were there filming that day and if you watch closely you'll see me lurking in the background with my camera. Over to Australia and Aaron Whittaker is hunting rabbits with a Ticker 2-2 rimfire. He takes his coffee break seriously but still finds time to shoot a few, then shows how to fry them Kentucky style. Air Hunter Gerhardt kicks off a new series with a look at this FX Panthera. It's primarily a target gun but he demonstrates it works pretty well for hunting too. Wash Wildfowler is out in the woods with his mate Robin shooting squirrels on a feeder. They have their work cut out but manage to bag a handful in 
including one impressive long shot threaded through the branches. County deer stalking and the Capriolas Club head to Glencoe in the Highlands of Scotland for some hardcore red deer stalking in difficult weather and challenging terrain. And finally, from Australia, Wells Adventures are on a family week of camping and feral pig shooting and hunting with dogs on a farm in New South Wales. That's it for this week. We've put all these films into a playlist for you. Click on the i symbol top right or check this film's description. If you have a YouTube film you'd like us to pop into the weekly top eight, email Charlie the link, charlie at fieldsportschannel.tv. Well, that is it for this week. If you haven't done so already, please whiz over to our website, fieldsportschannel.tv. You can click to like us there on Facebook and on Instagram. You can follow us on Twitter, subscribe to us on YouTube, pop your email address into our register page and we'll contact you about this show. Field Sports Britain is out at 7pm UK time every Wednesday. This has been Field Sports Britain. Good hunting, good shooting, good fishing and goodbye. <laughs>